like, can I talk to the audience? Can, can you introduce yourself and um, why are you here in this session? Hi, my name is uh, Pantari Sri Paiwan. I'm a VP of Sustainable Business from UOB Thailand. Um, I'm at, it's our first time for UOB Thailand attending this pavilion and the COP event as well. And I also have a speaking session tomorrow afternoon. So hope to see you all. Can we clap hand to welcome her? Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Jesse. I'm a youth delegate from Thailand, uh, currently working at BCG, Boston Consulting Group. Very interested in the health and food system space. Also have a speaking session on the third, so very happy to be here as well. And you, why, why are you here? Um, hello, my name is Maya and I'm here with YMCA, World YMCA, and I'm here because we're supporting one of our youth delegates. Hi everybody, my name is Shaquille Kareem. I'm with the World YMCA. You'll see 16 of us at this COP, if you can find us. Um, but we're here to support one of our delegates who is speaking, and uh, we actually made a connection with uh, the Thai uh, ministry with in uh, the APEC summit, which was three weeks ago. So we're just continuing the relationship. Hi, um, my name is Zena Rafidi. I'm also part of the World YMCA. And I'm actually very thrilled to be here and uh, looking forward for your sessions. Thank you, YMCA. Yes, why are you here? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chandra Vimo. I'm a professor of anthropology and African American studies at Colby College in Maine, in the States. And I'm here to support and be with Kai, who's going to be talking about well, youth action. From Kobe, from Maine, from the US. Thank you, welcome. And you? Hi, my name is Tamon Wan. I'm from UOB um, Thailand, from corporate banking side, because we have a lot of sustainable uh, activities in Thailand, so we just um, would like to participate in the Thai pavilion here. Great, we need more money in this. <laughs> we have two banker. yes. Hi, I'm Windy with Nikita here. Uh, we're from Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Uh, happy to be here, and we, we will have a session here on the 4th. See you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm from the United States. I'm an undergraduate student uh, studying psychology in Southeast Asia. So happy to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Luke Rausch, um, also from the States, um, an undergraduate as well. Um, excited to see what the youth session is all about, um, so yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Shogun, uh, or Kacha. I am a Thai youth delegate, and I'll be also be on the panel for today. Thank you. My name is Akira, I'm a Thai youth delegate as well, and I'm gonna be speaking in the panel as well. Okay, so wow, we have such a variety of the audience. So let's all the speaker on the stage. Yes. Do we have enough chair? Okay, so wow, this is such a different country, different part of the world here at the Thailand Pavilion. So welcome all of you. Uh, firstly, I would like to all of you to introduce yourself. And this is a great day to open a session with the youth energy. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Axel. I'm from Mexico. Right now, I'm the Global Youth Energy Ambassador for Latin America. 
at SE for All program. So thank you for inviting me here to talk around my experience on sustainable energy in Latin America. I'm uh, Yuhan Zhen from China. I'm currently doing PhD in Ireland, and also like I was working with the UNFCCC uh, Global Stock Tech teams. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aidwin. I'm an undergraduate at Colby College in Waterville, Maine, in the United States, and I'm here as the Colby delegate. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Isabel Huesa. I am from the US here with Washington University in St. Louis. I'm an undergraduate student studying anthropology with a concentration in global health and environment, biology and South Asian studies. Hi, my name is Valencia Aje. I am also an undergraduate from Washington University with Isa. And then I also, um, I study um, earth sciences with a specialty in climate science. And yeah, that's me. Hi everyone, I hope you're having a good day. I am Sofia, I'm 20 years old from Uruguay. And I am here with the YMCA delegation. And I am studying international relations in Uruguay. Hi everyone, my name is Shogun and Thank you so much for being here today. I am a youth delegate from Thailand, and right now I'm working, leading a venture studio fund in Thailand in the innovative space uh, in applied AI and blockchain to tackle climate issues. And while an undergraduate, I see a lot of undergraduates here, I also help uh, create a medical recycling startup in the US uh, that has repurposed more than $50 million worth of medical devices from the US to developing countries. And it's great to be here today, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Akira Travis Babbitt. I'm a high school student from, Frank, uh, from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I'm originally from Thailand, and I'm interested in tra uh, energy transition and climate change with attention to human rights and social justice, especially for local communities. Right now, I'm working on a project for, that's like a waste to value project for an elephant sanctuary in the north of Thailand. Um, my goal is to understand their lifestyle and help them uh, find a way to manage waste that is suitable for their lifestyle overall. Thank you. Perfect. Um, well, I will give you each person maybe one minute and a half pitch. I just wondering if you happen to meet any world leaders along the street and along this like talk um, at COP28. What will be your pitch for those leader to make the change? One point five minutes, one and a half minutes. Anyone's ready? You get. You can come and stand up and then. Who who first? Shogun me. Okay, yeah. Let's do it. You know me, Ah. Okay, pitch for the world leader. One point five. Let's practice. We're going to meet lots of them these two weeks. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hi, my name is Shogun, and thank you so much for being here at COP. Uh, I'm a youth delegate from Thailand, and I would like to say that um, as part of the youth delegates of Thailand, and also personally, I would like to see more collaborations happening, but also you seeing through these collaborations, because there's a lot of interesting conversations with world leaders all around, from different countries, from different organizations and sectors. But a lot of the conversations, once even there's an agreement, there's not a lot of follow through. And I would like to see that process being more transparent and you guys being more accountable uh, in order to realize all of these aspirations that we have. Because right now, um, we are very well below um, the standard of reaching our goal. Thank you. Woohoo! Faster than 1.5 minutes. Okay, next please. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's let's practice our pitch. So important. Well, if I meet someone here and I have some time to talk with them, I would love to ask them what place do they think that youth occupies on the table? And if they really take into consideration our thoughts and our opinions, because I really am seeing like a lot of initiatives 
And it seems like we do have a place on the table, but as you said, like the follow-up is not there, or I don't see it. And I was part of like youth programs that don't really end in nothing. So I would ask them if they think that should change, and if they value our opinion and our participation. Um, and I'm really tired of that, and I would love that to change. So that's what I would talk about. Woohoo! Okay, one minute per se pitch. Come on, <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> this thing is gonna happen accidentally, right? You just walk hit into Biden and then <laughs> before someone grab him. So you have to be quick and then you have to be powerful. Let's do it. Um, so first off, I would say, hi, my name is Valencia. I am a delegate from Washington University and I'm an undergrad and I study climate science. Um, essentially, I spend hours a day looking and spending time in the lab looking at climate science. I look at the data, I know the data, I read the papers, and at the end of the day, it's getting worse here. So I would just say thank you for being here in general because being at COP and being around all these um, people from the different parts of different cultures is a really huge thing. And I just wanna appreciate where we are right now and just say thank you for keep going because uh, nine, uh, nine a conversation with someone, they might not even remember me. So I just want them to remember from a conversation is we're watching and we hope that you keep going. <laughs> Great, thank you. We are watching, yes. Five more pitch to go. And the audience can pick which pitch is the most powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do it. It might happen. Yeah, I really have two things I'd like to mention, one of them being in order to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal, it is essential that we phase out fossil fuels completely from our energy resources. And the science shows that I think the presidency has made an emphasis to include oil companies and fossil fuel industries in those conversations, which is important in order to reach that phase out. And the second being that with this historic loss and damage decision, the work does not stop here. And in order to protect the countries, the vulnerable countries and developing countries that have called for accessibility, it's important that we think about how we're going to make the loss and damage fund accessible, fast to access, and eventually housed under the UNFCCC. Thank you. Yes, it's a big thing. Loss and damage fund has been established, but who is going to sit on that committee of the budget? It's very challenging. We keep watching. Okay, next. Um, if I were to meet an important delegate from anywhere, I would emphasize that I care deeply about coastal communities and food security. And I would want to know how they think that the loss and damage funds are going to help support coastal communities in the transition to find equitable and clean food. Um, and I think that it's really important to continue to educate people about food security and the ways in which we're going to support the coastal communities which are most vulnerable at this time. Perfect. Thank you. So many issues. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope I didn't have his note. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hello. And you will be a very important advocate because U.S. and China conflict here is quite there. So what will be your pitch? Uh, I'm not going to talk about U.S. and China. Oh, no, okay, like sure, sure, sure. Yeah, but uh, actually we are standing here and we are now like currently uh, way human. Uh, we are facing lots of Perfect. dangers and we are taking a stock take of how much have we achieved towards the Paris Agreement. And everyone is worrying about like uh, we are not on track. But there is some good sign that actually um, we have the agency, the human agency, to cope with the current climate crisis. Because one fifth of the world is covered by climate policies and mailing climate finance has already been distributed. And we already have the technology that we need actually to empower in this kind of energy transition or something but what we really need is how to use them like how to use them is kind of like we use the agency and we um, educate like current generation to learn to innovate and to really empower the future thank, thank you. you wow very powerful yes Nam King uh, Akira and you can close <laughs> um, my name is Akira and I would like to call attention to understanding the um, lifestyle that of local communities, especially 
like for example, for my project that I've been working on, at first, initially, this project was about ways to value and turning elephant dung into soil conditioners. But once I dove deeper into their problems, I realized that that wasn't the only thing that was going to solve their problems. What was going to solve their problem was waste management, because that would um, inc decrease the methane emissions and also help them with uh, water contamination problem and also the PM 2.5. And um, I just want to uh, everyone in this room to know that if you, we want to solve this problem overall, we have to get to the root of the problem and try to understand everyone in our communities, including the local communities, which has less of a voice in this subject overall. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Very small, tiny questions, but it actually impact the whole world. Thank you. Yes. Okay, my message to the leaders of the world is around bursting the bubble. If we want to generate more opinions on our sustainable energy world, we have to burst in the bubble. We have to burst the bubble, and we have to take this information, this knowledge on the streets to the people that really need. We have to collaborate, and we have to teach people that is an inexpert people around climate, because that people are on the streets doesn't believe on this agenda. So we need to talk with them. We need to communicate better our ideas, and we need to take out these opinions outside this climate world. We have to take these opinions to the real world in which the people doesn't believe in climate change and take uh, this all information, this youth uh, advocacy, this all uh, programs around climate and energy and take it to the people that really need that information right now. Thank you. Woohoo! Thank you. <laughs> it's such a powerful and other topics that need to be touched at COP. Um, but one thing, but, um, my questions to all the youth is, what do you think is um, the message that needs to be here about youth? Because according to what you say, do you really hear us, right? Like those world leaders and all this initiative sometimes has been made decision through such a group of people, but forgetting like people, vulnerable people, youth and many other things. If you can twist, um, the storytelling that can give more power to the youth um, voice, what would that be to the audience in, at COP28? Well, I think that young people really have the experience and the knowledge to really um, impact on, the, on this agenda. Sometimes global leaders doesn't believe in us because we are young, but we really are doing the work. We are doing the job every day. So doing the job means like we have experience to do it. And with this experience, we can uh, impact more people, we can teach them. So believe in us, believe yes. in young people, and take care about what are you doing right now because we are watching us. Great. Good. It's really, give me goosebumps, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm currently always thinking about like a very, very like strange things in my mind because I was thinking about the the, our brain, like our neural link. Because every day when you experience different things, when you are experiencing some outer, like external uh, attach or impact, uh, your neural link actually changes over time. So I was thinking like the currently, uh, like th the current generation who has already been educated, they think this, um, they think themselves as adults or as a mature people, but actually like the perception of current climate and energy is already sometimes confirmed, but actually our young people, we, we still in our process of constructing our neural links in our brain. Like it's like AI or something, we can not just be replaced by the AI or something like that. So I, I was thinking like our young generation, our uh, advantages actually that we are creating our own perception systems in our mind. We are connecting neural links to the new things, to the climate things or energy things and we are here and, and we would definitely innovate the futures. And I, I was really, really like hopefully, hopeful, yeah, thank you. I think besides the vast amount of knowledge that young people bring to the table, I think that young people are extremely passionate about the environment and environmental issues, and they also leave everybody else hopeful, and they themselves are more hopeful than other generations and populations of people. And I think that is what's going to drive global climate or global change. And I think that 
young people need to be taken more seriously during negotiations and during climate conferences like this because at the end of the day, it's our future that's in everybody else's hands. So I think that people need to be taking us more seriously. I agree. Taking us more seriously, yes. Yeah, to echo a few of the points that have already been brought up by my peers, but also to underscore something, the climate issues that we're facing today as youth were not created by us, and we're here addressing problems that we did not create, and we have to build that future for ourselves. And so similarly, I'd like to see more respect and legitimacy given to young people. And thankfully, that is something that we see, you know, for all of us at on this stage. I'm here as a delegate, as part of my university, as an opportunity given to me by my professor. And so there is that hope for students to be more involved in the process and the negotiation. Um, but again, similar to what my peers have already mentioned, we young people are the ones driving innovative solutions. We are the largest stakeholders in the process of creating a just future, a climate justice future, because we are the ones who are ultimately going to be living in that future. Perfect, yes. And let me make me think like in 10 years from now, no one's gonna be youth in this room, right? We are gonna be actor. So yeah, it's so important. This is like a, a seed for the future. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to emphasize what everyone else beautifully said. I guess the biggest thing is fo the biggest thing I would want to say is that it is our future. So being in these spaces, being able to talk and being taken seriously and having respect is so important because it is our futures that we are fighting for, or in the futures of um, our future generations. And pre pre and then pretty much everyone else else I said what I was going to say. So. Thank you. So in 2021, I was part of the pre-COP 2026, and a terrible thing happened, and it was that then in COP 26, we found the document that we made, 400 youth made that document, and we found it in the trash. But not only in the trash, we found it in the wrong section of the trash. So it was even funnier. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that was the moment that I mo like it put something in my mind that it won't go away. Um, I really thought like that document uh, was only delivered to the world leaders. So it had to be one of them that threw it away. Um, so I really th thought like. Like, I don't know why they asked for our opinions uh, if they won't take it into account. So I, I won't answer, like, give us the solution to the question, but I would say, like, I would really like for them to reach us and, like, to say, like, yeah, we have to um, find a solution for this. We are going to ask the youth and for it to really have a place in the solution afterwards, uh, and not just like make up youth programs to like found our opinions and then do nothing with that because it's very valuable. Um, so yeah, that's also th something that I would really like to change. Um, but I think that the problem is that we don't really have a place in the documents or in the decisions. Um, we are not like mixed with whatever they talk about. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. And after hearing from the youth from the stage, I want to hear from the audience as well. What is your reaction hearing all this thing? Yes. It's you always kind of hard to go second last because there's all these amazing opinions already being said. But um, I totally agree with all of you, and I want to add to your point. So. I think I see it in two ways. Uh, from on one hand, from like the world's leaders' perspective, I think that they need to always keep in mind that they're passing on the torch to the next generation. And in order for our society to progress, they need to pass on a sustainable future to to youths. So they should always keep youths in mind whenever do it. They're enacting any policies because the existential future of our planet is dependent on our communities of youth. And so, in every policy making, there should be 
sort of like a framework to in like include youth in mind. I think um, on the other hand as well, from the youth perspective, we are one of the most passionate communities in the world. We're born seeing the world full of possibilities and we're slowly disillusioned by you know, the bureaucracies of the world and eventually some of our dreams might have been lost with the world leaders when we see reality. But I think the youths have this vision and dream of what the future could be like and so let them paint the future, let them hear them out on what they see the limitless potential is. I think um, in one of the slogans that I saw at COP28, they say break out of the mode and like don't, don't see the limit to what can be done, right? I think that the youths really embody this spirit and so that's a very powerful community and voice. And to add on to Maria and also some of uh, like other people in, uh, in the panel as well, I think that we should have an actual stake so that our voices are not thrown into the trash Oh my we gosh, yes. We should have a voting stake in the governance process because we are a legitimate, legitimate voice in this process. And so I think that the government's framework needs to be changed in order to empower youth and actually empower them from, from a systemic perspective, not just from saying youth can engage in you know, conferences, but when our dialogues are not being you know, embraced fully in the process, there's no change coming from our, from our point of view. And so this is what I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in my opinion, as important as the opinions of the older generations is, I feel like all of us grew up in different times, different years, and youths grew up hearing their parents and grandparents tell them about how the world was a few years ago. And even though it was like such a small um, amount of year, the changes that happened between now and then were so big. Um, let's say from the coral reefs and like just the animals around the world that are going extinct every day, the temperatures that's increasing, the amount of litter that's in the ocean, it's just really devastating. And I feel like it's important to hear youth's perspective because we grew up seeing that increase. We grew up with that increase. We never saw what the world was before all this. We never saw what the world was before seeing trash in the ocean all the time. We never knew what it was going to the beach without seeing like one or like more than one bottle of plastic. And we never walked in the street and looked on the floor and not see cigarettes and just trash laying around. And seeing that perspective would help change the world because people would see how much it's affected us growing up because we've just never seen the world without all this um, climate change. Thank you. Wow, it's very impactful. So let me hear back from the audience after hearing all this great idea, advocacy, and all like a heartfelt reason why they are here. Is there any feedback that you want to give or your opinions? Yes, Wendy, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Wendy. Uh, very nice to hear all of you and um, very inspiring. Um, I really am happy with uh, what the youth has been saying. I, I've been following uh, the youth um, recommendations, but also visions and ambitions. Um, and you, ha uh, you are clearly have a very strong mission uh, to come here. And I'm, it's very unfortunate what happened to uh, the recommendations that were put out. Uh, I hope uh, the government can do better, a lot better. Uh, but also, I think I agree with um, some of you mentioned earlier that to have legitimacy and systemic perspective, because I think that's where the one of the problems lies. Uh, and I think that's also one of your peers was also advocating in the Asia Pacific Climate Week uh, just two weeks ago in Malaysia that uh, there should be um, a legal document that s that safeguard the space of youth in the decision making processes that your voice can actually go into the document, not just hearing and then you know uh, going to the trash, unfortunately, that could actually go into bills and, and laws. And uh, I think that one, one way to do so. But if I would like to also hear your uh, perspective on how would you see uh, the systemic uh, change should start, where? Uh, would, is, it, is it easier, maybe start at the local level first? Or uh, yeah, just, just want to pick on, on your brain a little bit. Thank you. Any more opinion on the floor to encourage our youth 
at COP. They are such an important tool. Just a second. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for s stepping up here and speaking. I'm Shaquille with the World YMCA, and we serve over 60 million uh, people across 120 countries. So we're very familiar with what a lot of young people say. I'm curious, um, do you feel that all your peers are united? Everyone is aware of the same problems. And what do you do if someone in your generation actually contradicts your argument? Because I'm thinking as we age, we change. And not every single young person who ends up in a position of power 20 years from now might have the same position as you. So I'm just curious, I would love to hear your thoughts at some point. What do you do when someone, your peer, challenges you? OK, uh, yes. Well, I, I think that's a really good question. Um, in my personal experience, I grew up in an old city. So all the people in my city works in oil company. So it's very hard to talk with them to make it reflection about this. First, because they are working there. They are earning money from there. So when I talk around climate, they feel like, you know, it's like a dangerous because maybe they can lose their, their, their lives, their benefits are right now, the oil company is given to them. So in that point, it's very difficult. But um, in a way, all these people that is working on inside the refineries have really health problems. So I'm, I'm trying to connect these people with that issue because they never think that they have, they have health problems because they're working inside. So trying to connect um, these issues to climate crisis, to the actual jobs that they have with health can give them like a more expand vision about what are they doing inside and why uh, they are losing their healthy and their quality of life because the oil and the fossil fuels agenda is taking up that uh, possibility to be a healthy people. So I think health is very good to connect with that. Thank you. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter what if other people are contradicting your ideas. What matters most is you taking the initiative, you taking the action, you caring about climate change. As long as you are determined enough to strive for your goal and strive for your target, it doesn't matter if they contradict your idea or not. And maybe one day if your idea or your initiative is a success and maybe it's like result might not affect, make a like significant effect to this climate change. And even if it makes the slightest effect, your action could probably inspire those people who used to contradict your idea. So I think taking action is the most important thing. Yeah, so actually when I think about disagreements, I see disagreements not happening just, you know, within the youths, but adults disagree all the time as well. And adults also have changed their minds countless, countless of times throughout history. Even, you know, yesterday and today, we have changed our minds perhaps through conversations. So I see parallels between adults and youths in that, you know, um, if youths can disagree, adults have always been disagreeing, right? So what differentiates youth from adults? I think that sometimes there's been too much placement on you know, a youth voice and not enough you know, flexibility to give to them, to allow them to you know, change their voice and learn and grow. And I think um, we should create an inclusive space that allows for genuine conversations uh, to come in and not just you know, hold someone to an idea because an idea can always change and we're always you know, changing with dynamic ideas uh, and improvements all the time. We should change, and same as adults. So that's why I think um, there should be a platform or like a structure, a way that allows youths to, in fact, come in and ready to have their minds changed and evolve over time. Same with adults as well. Um, and in that way, I think that we can all grow together and there will be disagreements, but then there'll be productive conversations and solutions that are coming out of the disagreements. I really, I really li like your question. I think it's really interesting. Um, I guess for me, when discussing um, just the 
competition of climate science. Being from the United States, there are some very divided opinions about it. But in my personal experience, um, being a climate scientist instead of studying the, sci the science, I realize that some people lack some understanding and there is a gap of knowledge. Um, so just also putting it into perspective. So when people hear it's doomsday, the world's gonna end, but the world doesn't end, they're like, okay, well, what, what's, what's really true in fact? But we're really tying it to um, like in some states in the US, there's heavy flooding and those are like family members. There's wildfires in California and those are like affecting family members. So seeing the effects of today and seeing how um, these things are happening right now at, as we speak, really um, helps people helps put people into a better understanding of in the future it's only going to get worse essentially yeah yeah just to add on to a couple of points that have already been mentioned i think it's a little naive to think that a huge body such as youth are always going to agree um, and similar to a previous point brought up, it's also impossible to hold youth or any one person to ideas that are constantly changing. And so uh, one thing that I would say to address said disagreements among you know, a small group, a large group, um, is empathy and uh, active listening, I think. From my personal observations of negotiations, I think sometimes uh, empathy and humanity are things that are lacking and we can get so caught up in political positionalities and this is our country's view on this, this is where we stand on that, that there is not actual listening happening from other sides, other people, and that might sound really rudimentary, but truly it is like one of the building blocks to effective dialogue um, and solutions and kind of speaking to Valencia's point about knowledge gaps. And I think this might also address Wendy's question a little bit, but um, ways to get youth kind of more systemically involved in dialogue with each other would be expanding education. You know, I'm here with the privilege of attending a private university um, on a scholarship and the only reason that I am here is because I have those opportunities. Um, but I also come from a super small rural town in North Carolina where uh, the people, my neighbors, they don't know about the issues that I'm here talking about. And so I think before you can even think about systemically adding any legal documentation to include youth in the process, you have to begin by providing educational opportunities for youth to learn about these very issues aside from the, our real lived experiences, which are also legit. Um, but if we're going to, if people in power now are going to pass the baton to youth later on, we need to know about process. We need to know about negotiations. Um, so I think education is an important first step. A very interesting question, thank you. And especially for your question about like if your peers want to challenge you. Because like currently there's a critical thinking and shock on my mind. Because if you're thinking about that, we are all today in this little box, like the pavilion. We are so passionate about climate change and energy transition. And I'm traveling around the world to see my colleagues. I see you everywhere when I attend all this youth conference and initiatives related to climate change. I see you and I see your passions. I, I feel I'm very wished for, for our future. But actually, I think sometimes if we are thinking out of the box, not only in us, because what we see now, we are in a box like we see all the people who share the same passion like us for the climate change. But whether or not if someone who doesn't care about that anymore, because like these times when I come to Dubai to the COP28, one of my friends who is not in the climate change realms anymore, she's from finance. And she also participated me in participating all the youth events of the climate change. But what she concluded is that she didn't really care that much. And she 
don't see the necessity or something like that. I, I'm not angry with this perspective. I'm just thinking this is existed in the world. Like no matter what you see in the world, the opposite always exists. So what we might need to do is like not the inclusive or the other people who disproportionately affected in the world, but also the inclusivities of our mindset of this. We're not here like to just change them with our passion. We cannot do that. But what we can do is to really understand like the logistic behind that, why they are they don't care that much. And what we can do is just to change our mindset into the action that we can do and to make every nuanced effort that we can make. Yeah. Yes, very beautiful answer, all of you. And Tata, one of our proud youth from Hello. Thailand. Do you have anything to feedback or give? give ad yes. Yeah, I think you guys make such great points. I would just have, I have one question specifically for people who are still in the education system. So for high school and university, do you feel like when you take these courses and you study about climate change, do you feel like there are, you know, when you look into the future, there's like jobs, there's a pathway towards working in sustainability in climate, do you see that pathway? Are you concerned about it? Are your peers concerned about it? And how does that, what does that look like to you? Can you s tell us a little bit about that? So what's education system really form you to, to confront with the reality in the world? Nam King, okay. Um, I study high school at Concord Academy. It's like 40 minutes away from Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm really lucky to be in a school where they really promote students' voice. Uh, they r really listen to our voice and takes our voice into a deep consideration. So our school has a lot of um, initiatives on climate change. And um, I'm right now, I'm like a sustainability manager for my ha boarding house that I live in. There's also other initiatives like um, environmental revs. And what we do is we look out for um, initiatives that are related to climate change within our school. And I feel like our school really um, put supports us with small initiatives that can one day become bigger. Uh, there are also classes at our school that are related to environmental for both environmental engineering and environmental sciences. And I just feel like our I'm just really lucky to be in the school where they really prom promote our voice, listen to our voice. and. I'm not sure about universities and other high schools, but in my opinion, I feel like my high school system is really so suitable for youth's voice. So I am in university, but through all my life, I've never had climate education, um, never. And that results in me right now out of 150 students being the only one that is concerned about climate change or like taking climate action. Um, and yeah, so like my peers, they don't really care about climate change. Uh, and back, for example, wha back when I started Fridays for Future in my city in 2019, uh, at first they were like, doing something or going to clean spaces with me. But then that movement ended because I planned uh, like um, an activity and I was the only one there. So yeah, there's no really anyone that is concerned about that. Uh, I'm lucky that I'm in a country that is not that bad um, in a lot of aspects. But yeah, and as answering to your question, I think that the systemic change uh, or the systemic perspective is achieved throughout education. Um, and I think that that's where we should put um, our efforts to change the education system. Because maybe if I had the chance to live in a place where students get a climate education, maybe uh, there would be more Uruguayans here, for example. Um, so yeah, I think that education is very, very important. Um, and luckily, things are slowly changing. Um, it's really make me think of your answer that sometimes education is not increased awareness. 
right? Because there's so many students or youth that confronting climate change every day and still don't, don't really have climate education, but it's actually they're learning from the experience. And I think it is so important. And think beyond education. We need education, but it's education is not an answer for awareness as well. So great, thank you. Um, I know for me, in high school, I barely touched anything involving climate science. And then when I went to university, at Washington University, I pretty much owe everything to my institution because I am sitting here because of that institution. And even though they did send me here, I will say there is some, um, I guess, like gaps when it comes to climate science specifically. Um, like in my department, it's um, climate science is relatively low, however, there have been movements to increase it. There have been there have been um, more hiring of more faculty that are climate science. Um, there have been a move to do more initiatives that involve climate science and um, reaching out fr through um, primary school ages and ed education. So though there is a slow and lack of huge climate science um, things at my institution. There, I have seen an immense um, growth in it from when I was a freshman to when I am now a senior. Perfect. And I think the whole education system should turn around and talk about climate because what else you want to talk about with the future of humanity? Because we probably will confronting the great extinction and this turn will be us. So yes, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, I attend a really small liberal arts college, Colby College, and I think the top or the thing that I've gleaned the most from it is the great mentorship from the professors who are extremely passionate about their work, and they really want to support their students. And so um, they're very hopeful for the future and climate change and climate policy. And I think that their hope has transferred to the student body and makes me extremely hopeful for my future and uh, my career moving forward. So I think that hope and passion that's transferable is what institutions have, or the ones that have it, it's extremely powerful to younger students. Um, and that's what I'm gleaning from it. Thank you. Shokun. Um, so I also wanna add, and but as someone who has you know graduated from an educational institute already, but then as someone who's started some initiatives while in college. So while in college, I you know help create a, a, health, a healthcare and sustainability social enterprise that repurposes medical devices and medical waste from the US to countries in developing countries. Um, and throughout the whole process, we got a lot of support from our institution, from the institution that I attended, uh, Yale University. And I, there were always pitch competitions. There were always you know, um, faculty support and guidance throughout. Um, and even after you know graduating from college, uh, as we moved on to work uh, while in New York, um, there were you know foundations like, for example, Ford Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, J.P. Morgan, or McKinsey's uh, awards that granted us or allowed us you know some leeway to continue growing the social enterprise to where it is today. Um, but I also think that you know because there's all of the support, the organization is able to self-sustain to this day. There are probably a lot of students who have ideas um, and have gotten a lot of support in college, but then once they graduate, they, it's very difficult to find sources of funding that are not you know, perhaps profit driven. And I think that there needs to be a follow through um, you know, in addition to just the support, the structural support in institutions and the edu education that's taking place um, in the, you know, the real world, like adult world, post college as well, in order for these initiatives to keep sustained because um, a lot of yeah startups that start in college die after students graduate from college, and why is that the case? There should be sustained support because these are brilliant initiatives. I think that the funding model and the structure of support um, post college is extremely important, um, and as well as education. Yeah. Wow, it's really touched to the whole money mechanism that we're talking at COP here as well. So yes, thank you, Shogun. So yes, um, one question's turned to be the whole, no, from you, from you. <laughs> the one question's turned to be like a whole um, discussion. So 
at the end, I would like to end with the creativity. And I think youth at COP is actually mean hope to me and hope to everyone. So um, Thailand Pavilion would be very supportive for all your energies. And we also have many higher education um, panels that we want to question hard what the education or higher education do to climate change. And I think please join us to those sessions as well. So at the end, I think we have many um, honorable guests um, to the, ba the climate um, banker <laughs> here from UOB. Um, we have a human rights expert, Wendy, and we also have Professor Beth Smith, um, Beth Martin, I'm sorry, Beth Martin from WashU. And we want, and many more. I think it's great for us to hear what are they doing as their project? So maybe I will give you another minute to pitch your work. Maybe you get some money from UOB. <laughs> maybe you get some um, scholarship more further from the Wash U. Thank you. Well, right now, uh, oh, sorry. I can can four of you um, be in front, huh? No, call. Nong nong, just sit up, need me, right? Huh? Can I, huh? Wendy, yes. This is probably gonna be like um, the real life <laughs> committee. Wendy, please be in front. But more than just putting the winner on things, but of course the audience as well. Please give some advice to these hopes and initiative. They're gonna give you advice, and I think you probably need it at the right time right now, because what needs to be improved, what needs to be clear, and what needs to be add on. I think this is such a good clinic, audience, feedback to, to you as well. So please stand here. I give you only a uh, like elev elevator pitch, so maybe one minute. And you want to go first? Sure, yes. Please introduce yourself and just continue. Thank you. Well, um, right now in my organization, we want to invert the way that uh, young people is like uh, participating in events. So uh, we know that right now um, we can create like events with in which people are like re really have like information about climate and sustainable energy, for example. But my idea is to take less experts uh, and work with more inexpert people because I think inexpert people right now have to be uh, the, the, um, the main point of this agenda. For example, uh, in Guadalajara, that, that is the place that I come, um, the government gave me a, a sustainable park. Well, it's not sustainable at all because it's only a park right now, but the idea is to convert this park into a sustainable park and create like a um, community around this park. I think uh, if we can uh, take one place and this place is converting to uh, a way in to impact all the environment around. Could be a great idea. And generate inside these um, parks um, communication skills, um, entrepreneurship. Uh, for example, try to attract people around sports, for example. That is something that is not related with energy, for, but uh, right now we're starting like a swimming competition for uh, March. Is that swimming for sustainable energy, and all the people is start to swim for for that commitment. And for example, we have um, thirty seconds. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, arts too is really important on this agenda because when you, uh, for example, you have like um, a rap battle in which 20, 20 experts of, on sustainable energy uh, is going to teach twenty rappers, and these rappers is going to create like a rap inspiring on sustainable energy. In, I think this is a way to connect with more people that is not working on this agenda because energy agenda is very complex. 15. So if we can to create like new skills, new ways to communicate this agenda, it will be more attractive for young people. Sorry, yes, the elevator ends. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to give feedback right away or what's, yeah. Thank you and yes, um, my name is Tamon Wan. I'm from corporate banking side uh, from UOB Thailand. So just from the commercial point of view, okay, it's actually my first time here in COP28. 
uh, actually never been in a COP event before, and it's very inspiring and very um, you know enlightening and encouraging to hear from the youth like you guys. And you know, um, having these mindsets make this world a better place. I really wish that these mindsets would spread across you know uh, people all over the world. And it's, I mean, the easiest thing is that um, make yourself believe, right, and then spread across as an individual person. For me, I think the most challenging part is how you, you know, also spread these ideas to those commercial players, you know, to those uh, industrial, you know, the players who are probably the most uh, GHG emissions in the industry, like fossil fuels, you know, industrial players. How do you convince them that, that uh, you know, climate change is really uh, important? that they have to be considered. And sometimes for those business players, you know, it's, um, they're standing probably on the other side of the sustainability because they are also thinking about commercial as well. So I think it's important for the youth like you guys, you know, to, um, you know, try actually be in these organization as well and spread these, you know, positive thinking and, you know, to make them uh, realize that how important it is. Yeah. Thank you. Any comments for his project? Very good. Uh, yes. And I, I agree that um, I myself, uh, when I start looking at uh, climate change documents, it can be very difficult. So using arts, like creativity, is, I think is very useful, uh, especially those that may not be exposed to this um, agenda before. So using different ways of communicating is good in, in terms of increasing awareness, especially those that have not been exposed to this. Because um, that's also what I've learned uh, in my work on human rights, is to tone down a little bit the language so then people can actually understand what you mean and get behind you to support. So very good. Thank you. Comments? And I have just one quick piece of feedback. Right at the beginning, you were talking about with your events that you write that you don't want to work with in expert you don't want to work with experts you want to work with in experts <laughs> right did i understand you correctly so you said yes no no and my what i'm saying is I, I love that but i would encourage you to think about the fact that even those in experts are experts in their own individual knowledge mm. so thinking about not you know framing thinking about how you're communicating and framing and that they're not less than they have very valuable things to say and to engage and participate, and recognizing that their expertise is just a different type of expertise. It may be a lived expertise. It may not be an academic expertise, but that is equally valuable. So thinking about as you're, as you're framing and as you're working on those events to, to think about that. Thank you. Talk to the opposite. Um, include everyone, right? And then make it very simple get to the point. This is actually not for youth, it's for everyone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, quickly, thank you. Just small uh, feedback. I think uh, your project is very um, creative in a way. I like that you use the art and um, the people in the local to create. It's kind of like the building influencing each other to make the, 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 the place a better and more sustainable so people can think more about sustainability and think that oh it's like very close to their life is how they're living yeah thank you we probably can't go through all seven or eight projects so probably two or three projects who want to have a project and want to try okay <laughs> okay you first and then <laughs> okay come yes please one minute one minute <laughs> Stand here, stand okay. here. Be in front. It's okay, be in front. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, then I bring two projects here for a pitch and for your collaboration with us. Uh, the first one is with IEEE Young Profession. IEEE, as we all know, is uh, the world largest authoritative engineering, electricity, like uh, academic communities. But IEEE Young Professional is like the people with uh, the young people 
with their expertise. They're in their early PhDs and they're in their early academic career. And we want to um, engage the IEEE young profession to write in a guidebook for the youth and their academic or their ways of solving the current climate change and energy transition problems. And what we are going to initiate this is next year, we are collaborating with some international um, organization like IRENA, International Renewable Energy Agency, and also like IEA and also some other projects. Because uh, from the local perspective, I think it's good, like uh, like my colleagues said, uh, like in arts and more community perspective. But I also thinking we need to exchange our academic ideas with all those kind of uh, the high level peoples and to integrate our part in it. And yeah, that is our topic. And we are already in process of it and we are uh, launching our editorial board and also like partnership. If you're interested, just to let us know because we want to expand. Uh, okay. The elevators end. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but welcome to like engagement in this. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, so as an engineer, I can tell you even through my career, I've seen that the tools that you have in your toolbox, right? And that's what I think part of what you're getting at with a guidebook for youth through IEEE, they've changed dramatically. And I think that that's one thing that many of the younger students can bring to the old folks like us, right? When I was in engineering school, I was not taught the tools that you all are learning now. And so trying to think about how do you take those tools and help translate, not just to the youth themselves, but then how does that work its way up? How does it work its way up the chain to older, older engineers, li uh, like myself, yes. who may or may not have had? So the guidebook you're thinking about, I would encourage you to think about it not just as a guidebook for youth, but a guidebook for all, all ages. For me, because many of us, us didn't <laughs> learn what you're learning yes. in school now. Perfect, inclusive still. Any? I think it's a very good idea to have a guidebook, but just to ensure that um, it can be usable for, for yes. youth in a broad spectrum, because I think you are all here very good, but then what's important what when you come back, what you do? Because uh, I think you are in a very, my, uh, for lack of a better word, you are very privileged to be here, but uh, what's count is what's going after Dubai. Um, that's where the hard work will, will lie, and this guidebook might be uh, a one tool to do that, yeah. So yeah, good luck. <laughs> Any convincing for the finance sector? The uh, tools box. <laughs> I think having a guidance book is great because right now the financial institution, they're also like uh, launching some kind of industry best practice um, guideline or guidebook, but it's like 200 pages long. And it's impossible for us to take all that and like digest and actually implement to make real impact. So just keep in mind that the guidebook is great, but it's like you mentioned, like what what after the step after that to make sure that it's gonna turn into like a real impact, yeah, and implementable. Yeah. Thank you. Same. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great project. Two last. Hi, my name is Akira Travis Babbitt. I'm currently studying in high school in Massachusetts and. I'm working in on an, a project with the hopes to inspire people worldwide to take small initiatives that can possibly inspire people around the world and one day result in a bigger impact. My project is about turning, it's about waste to value. It was initially a waste to value project where I turn elephant dung in an elephant sanctuary and then turn them to soil conditioner which could result in a second source of income for them because their only source of income was tourism and because of their not so aesthetically pleasing um, environment because from their waste that's not well managed, their source of income from tourism is decreased with like um, the problem of COVID-19 as well. So I wanted to help them turn waste that they are not gonna use into something that is has more value. And when I dove deeper into this project, I realized that that wasn't the only problem. The main problem is also waste management that they don't have enough knowledge about. So I did deeper research and helped them fi find a way that could work with them and support their lifestyle. I went to trips to the sanctuary and got to know Ten their seconds. lifestyle and eventually um, can help them to find ways to limit methane emission and 
um, water contamination uh, and also the plenty elevators <laughs> closed. <laughs> so can I say export elephant poops? <laughs> okay. Yes. Any comments on this project? Okay, um, I have to say that I really like uh, your idea, you know, and um, it actually tr uh, is something that they, something that they are capable of uh, doing so, you know, and also you can turn it into commercial site for them as well, as well as, you know, doing the good for the world. So I, I really like the idea. You got a funding from UOB. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a quick question <laughs> first. Where is this project? Ah, in the north part of Thailand. Okay, so one thing that you said that I really just wanted to to um, reinforce and admire was the fact that it sounds like that you're working with the community, and you're really thinking about and going back to the the concept earlier, right, of the expert versus inexpert, but recognizing that that community themselves has a tremendous amount of knowledge, um, and thinking about how do you use and tap into that knowledge while you're also bringing a different level of expertise. And so it's not, it's not a, a hierarchy, it's how do you bring those together to think about you know, co-creating solutions. So I just wanted to, to commend you for, for that part of what, how you described your project. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Last two projects. Shokun or the lady first? <laughs> Lady shoes first. Okay, Shokun come. She shoes. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, elevator begin. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thank you. So I have two things that I want to talk about, and I guess it's not necessarily a pitch about what I'm doing, but then I just want to bring open a discussion, a floor for discussion, for in case anyone's interested afterwards. So I'm interested in two main things. The first thing is, you know, like. Um, waste management, but also waste management from, you know, not only the end product, but like up the, you know, supply chain vertical at the very beginning. Um, so throughout my life, I've been involved in uh, recycling different things. So for example, re refurbishing used hard drives, uh, refurbishing uh, recycled uh, papers to convert them into notebooks um, for use, and also um, converting wasted inventory into like wood, for example, into like standing desks. Uh, in industrial companies, as well as you know, medical recycling and repurposing used medical devices from the U.S., developing countries, um, and all of that. So I'm interested in in that, and I would love to see um, how we can further, you know, reduce waste and Ten also seconds. decarbonize supply chain. The second part is um, innovation. So funding innovation and creating like an entrepreneurial ecosystem for these changes to happen. I'm currently working on a fund. Uh, and I'm, I want to fund innovation in this space, and I would love to hear from you all um, <laughs> if you're interested. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, what I catch from you is the word supply chain, which I think is really important for the business to really mitigate the impacts, because the impact right now is not just the direct impact that created from themselves, but it's also the upstream, the downstream. So it, it's good that you think it into that scope as well. Yeah. Yes, supply chain. Um, I think it's, it's very good that you have um, ideas to ha fund innovations. And I listening to, uh, from your uh, pitch earlier on that you actually have started doing this uh, previously at schools, if I'm not mistaken. So it's really good that you're continuing this, and uh, I think your one is, is better with the with the financing bits here, with the supply chains and whatnot. But um, yeah, but kudos to you, and um, looking forward to to listen more um, afterwards. Woohoo! <laughs> Marshan in yes. So I can just make a quick comment. Um, picking up yes, also I picked up on the supply chain concept too, but thinking about as well, it's. How do you think about waste and just a sense of is it actually waste, right? And how do you think about what happens in a circular manner? Like, how does it not just waste, but how is it then reused and re-entered in? So thinking about, as you're thinking about supply chains, as you're thinking about waste management, almost that idea of maybe it's not waste, but product. Um, you know, years ago in the US, when some of the very initial environmental laws came into place, you know, chemical companies, for example, actually maximize profit by reducing waste because 
they were retaining product, right? And so it was the thinking about like, you know, it's a waste or it's a product. And so it's not, anyway, I'm gonna stop because I'm starting to ramble, but it just got me thinking about some things and that's always a good thing to get your audience Very thinking. Very sen. <laughs> Thank you. Last project. Woohoo! One minute, no? I want, <laughs> I want to be just to all. Yes. Start. So uh, I'm here with the YNCA, um, uh, but back in Uruguay, I work with the youth between 13 and 18 years old. I help them make their community project. It doesn't have to be necessarily about climate change, but that's where I focus the most because uh, I started mine years ago, so I can help them with a lot. And they al we also give them funding and stuff so they, they can really create their project. And I'm also starting a, a little business doing like a concentrated dishwasher to reduce the plastic 75% uh, or more. Uh, so we are starting with that uh, with my brother. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. Thank you for your time. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Great idea. No investment? Human right? <laughs> okay. Um, I think one thing to think about, particularly in working with youth, in young youth, it, anything and everything we do at this point in our life is about climate change and any type of project that they have, any type of work that they're doing, it either is gonna be impacted by climate change or maybe even have an impact on climate change. So I think you know all of the work that's done with youth is valuable in whatever context. And I think along those lines, and you know, we were talking a little bit about education and how do you bring that in, being able to have that conversation and help them make those connections. Um, so whatever it is that's important to them, whatever their passion is, whatever project they're working on, and how do they see it connected in? And the other thing I wanted to pick up on a couple of you just said, I think the value of building community is tremendous because I think strong communities will help all of us in any type of climate change challenge that we exactly. face. Exactly, yes. I just want to echo her point to uh, work with the communities and I'm actually want to, I'm interested with, with you um, how you communicate uh, climate change with the younger uh, youth, like 13 and... Uh, or below, because um, um, we're trying to work on this a little bit more and then want to pick up your brain on how to do that best. Uh, because we we don't want to be the one that tells them what to do, but it's, it has to be the other way around. Uh, but yeah, if, if, you, if we can talk a little bit later after this, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, I agree with both of you. And also I think, uh, you know, it's good to, to have a starting point, you know, having an um, initiative, you know, having some project, the next step is how to implement it. And for yourself, you also have implement something. You have the um, concentrated dishwashers already, right? So I think, yeah, it's something that, you know, something small but can be implemented, that's a good start. Thank you so much. Wow, this is start from youth and become intergenerational conversation. Please give a hand to our commentator. <laughs> and please give a big hand and big heart to these eight hopes <laughs> in COP28. And before we end this quarter half an hour, can we have a good photo with them on the stage? Everyone please with all the audience. If you sit far, sit near, but yes, please have a good photo with us. Yes, sure, yeah. The youth can come down or stand up. Okay. Thailand. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, Paul Jong Lak, the director Jong Lak, will give the gift to the commentator and then speakers, and we will have the whole group of audience as a group photos. Ha, <laughs> This is. Elephant, but no poops. <laughs> this is from Nong Nam King Project, right? Oh. 